much. There we go. Does anyone that know that cool. want their photo taken? Just like let me know. I'll be taking some photos. Okay. Oh, what kind of hair? Have it wrapped. I want to thank everybody for coming to the Black Lesbian Archives Workshop Archival Project. Remember when I reached out to you, Candace? I think we were supposed to do this, what, in June? Yeah. Yeah, we were supposed to do this in June first, but uh, Imani was like, let's just wait. Like, wait till after everything is kind of taken in first, and then we can do the archival project to kind of wrap it in. So I appreciate you for coming. Thank yeah, you. thank you for inviting us. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And your name again was? Asti. Asti. Asti and Matt. Meg, Maggie, 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 Maggie. Thank you for coming, um, and everybody else too. Like this, this project has been like eye opening to the fullest. Um, it's it's gonna be a lot of good stuff coming coming through. Um, if you have any archives or you want to talk about maybe some of the archival work, especially when it comes to Black lesbian work, come through to the community and talk to me. Definitely. Um, Yvonne's in the building. We got Lucy in the building. Um, definitely um, some good stuff coming through. So, yeah, if you have any questions, let me know. But other than that, I'm going to let Candace do, do the thing. Yeah, yeah thanks, <laughs> crew. Uh, no problem. Yeah, thanks for, thanks for inviting me to do this. Um, I'm Candace Ming. I'm the archivist for the Southside Home Movie Project. Uh, we collect, preserve, and digitize small gauge film from residents across the South Side. So uh, right now we have about 25 collections, about 300 objects, um, and we just launched our digital archive um, where you can actually search and view everything digitized. And uh, we subject tag things, tag things by year, by your location, um, and you can actually comment on stuff if you recognize anybody. So. Um, but yeah, I've been doing these type of personal preservation workshops for the past year. I started doing them with Maggie Brown, who's Oscar Brown Jr.'s daughter, and who has his entire archive of paper, screen, uh, screenplays, scripts, uh, musical notations, books, um, photographs. She has some video. She even has master audio track recordings. And we started it just because she didn't really know what to do. And um, I also feel like I want to bring my expertise to people to be able to preserve their own film, their own material um, themselves, and what they should do, how they should digitize, how they should store. Um, so I'm going to broadly talk about everything. Uh, I normally do one material a session, but um, we've got a, a lot of times so I can do everything. And then I have some handouts here that talk about paper and book, photo, and then also caring for your home movies with videos if you want to take them. Also, our sign up mailing list is here if you want to get on here, and buttons and postcards. So um, I guess I'll start with paper. Um, paper is probably almost the easiest format in some ways to preserve. Um, you don't really, it doesn't really need a lot of like cold, cold storage. Um, you can almost store it at room temperature. Um, actually, uh, that's right, a wheel. Uh, let's see, paper, 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 press things. Yeah, this is more media, but I mean, paper is like 60 degrees. 30 to 50 percent humidity. So that's like your home, you know. Um, but what you want to do is be careful of things like if you have carbon paper, um, letters, newspaper. Newsprint is also really susceptible to fading because of the dyes and the uh, type of material it was on. It can really yellow and become brittle. Um, so what you would do then is put it in like a clear uh, sheet of like um, polyurethane or uh, acetate um, film just to put it in there and you can put it in a folder um, and all your boxes and folders should say um, acid buffering or um, archival box but some be wary of things that just say archival box because some things say that and they may not really be that um, 
acid buffering means that it's going to try and inhibit the leach of acid off of these materials, which is what makes them decay. Um, so yeah, so then and they have acid buffering folders, they have acid buffering um, boxes that you can place things in. Um, but yeah, newspaper, carbon paper are probably the most susceptible to that to that stuff just because of the um, flimsy nature of the material. And um, but letters and things like that tend to hold up pretty well. Um, if you have something very important, again, you can put it in a between two plastic sheet, um, give it a stiff backing and protects it, and then you can place it in a folder and then place that folder in a box. So, <laughs> so that's kind of what you do. And then um, you can label then label the folder, label the box. Um, I think labeling is probably one of the big things people struggle with. I mean, I know in my family, um, we don't have a lot of paper, but we have a lot of photographs that were actually from my grandmother's uh, mother, who, and they've both since passed. So I'm going through them and trying to talk to my granddad about who is it and all this stuff, but it's like, he doesn't know. And really the only person he can identify is my great grandmother. Um, so I think like, labeling your photos, and you can just write in pencil on the back, um, labeling documents, going to your elders to try and get that information now will really help in the long run. Um, because once they pass, that information dies with them. Um, photos, um, you want to store in a much cooler environment than paper. Um, I do have a photo by the way. Let's see. So, so color film you want to store in a kind of cold 40 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, 30 to 50% humidity, which could be a basement or cooler closet room. Um, I don't like basements because basements can flood. So that's the danger of storing things in a basement. They can also have mold or other environmental things, but perhaps a, a cool closet in your home um, and where it's dark, um, you could store the photos. Um, and really what you're looking for with color is the color image could decay, the acetate binder that binds the emulsion to the, so photos are made up of the picture layer and then a base that holds it. And for acetate, that can decay, just like with paper, um, just because of the, the composition of acetate. And so you'd get kind of like the, the image starts to disappear or crinkle. And then for color image, the color dyes can also fade and give a weird tint, usually like a red or um, maybe bluish tint to your films, if, if you've seen that. Um, so stabilizing it and putting it in that cool environment is really important. And for photos, again, you want something acid buffering, but photos, um, then you also want something that says, uh, passed a PAT test. And a PAT test is a photographic activity test. Um, and that means that the materials won't cause any further decay of the color or emulsion um, binder. Um, so look out for that when you're buying materials. I, I buy my materials from Gaylord. Um, they're an archival supply company. You can even, you can get stuff from actually Dick Blick art materials, like the um, the sheets to to put things in. You can actually buy those at Dick Blick. Um, Container Store actually is where I get my archival boxes, <laughs> if you can believe that. <laughs> they sell several archival boxes and um, media storage boxes that do have passed those tests. Um, so yeah, um, and then yeah, the labeling right in pencil on the back, if you know who it is, um, for photos, uh, you can, again, if you want to put them between some sort of plastic sheeting that has passed that test, and then you can put that in a binder. Um, that's just, a, it's a protective measure. Um, and then for photos, you always want to wear, um, gloves just white cotton gloves to handle it. Um, if you don't have them, just hold it by the edge so you're not 
um, getting thumbprints or other oils on the image surface. Um, paper, you actually, it can actually be more dangerous to handle with a glove um, because the glove can actually tear and it's, you know, it can be harder to manipulate. Um, and if the paper's fragile, the handling with the glove can actually be more dangerous. So I actually tend to not use a glove when handling paper. I'm just very careful and hold it by the edges. Um, and then, and then if you have slides like this, this one's, I, I grabbed the wrong roll that's overexposed. Um, but I, if you have a large collection of slides, um, I didn't bring the binder I use, but they do sell like, you know, plastic sheets that can fit, so you can hold 20 slides. And so you can put all those in there. And I like that a little better because then you can actually see the slides. They do sell some boxes that's like an enclosed thing where you would put the slides in and then kind of holder and then enclose the box. But I don't like that because you can't, then you can't see what the slides are. Um, so for our slide collections, I actually use um, 20 to, yeah, it's about 20 slides to a roll. And then you can kind of, these aren't labeled yet, but there is some space, you know, around the edges to write in pencil. Um, you know who this might be or where it is and then you can just place it in the holder and then the binder you get would be acid buffering and um, archival and then you can just flip it around and then you can see what you're looking at because a lot of times I think too slides don't get developed so um, how do you develop a slide? Like, use oh uh, well I don't know, <laughs> I'm not sure how they did it back then, but to do a print. Mm -hmm. um, now I scan them digitally and I got them blown up. Uh, I actually did that for an exhibition because these slides are from the GD Patton collection. Um, but they, people took slides, but then like would make prints um, or they would just take slides and do like, or they did have a slide projector and screen, so I'm sure they were like, look, you know, but, but fill your carousel and then, we're just gonna be like, this is our vacation. <laughs> and so, and then they just go back in a box. Um, so that's kind of, I think that's how people use slides. They didn't tend to actually make a larger like print out of them. Um, but we did that for an exhibition and then it was really nice because then we were actually able to give them to the family. Um, and there were some great shots of uh, Miss Jean who donated the collection. Um, so yeah, and slides again, handle with gloves, by the edges. Um, you can find uh, something called PEC, PEC cleaner. Um, if you think the surface is dirty, just uh, you know, put some, put some of them on the cloth and gently rub. Um, they also sell blowers. You can blow some of the dust off. Um, I would recommend doing that only if you're going to digitize them so you can get a clear image. Um, and for slides like these, without a backing, I would recommend a flatbed scanner. Um, even a home one can be good, um, but you want to make sure you have a scanner where you can adjust the DPI to at least, at least, well, for these slides, I would say at least 600 DPI at minimum, because um, they're, they're Kodachrome, so they're, there is a lot of great color information in here um, that you don't want to lose. And so then the higher the DPI, the better the resolution. Um, these are, at a, I scan these at something crazy because it's for archival, but they're like 4,400 DPI. But I don't think, that's not necessary for um, personal <laughs> use. Um, and then you always want to scan to a TIFF, which is a tagged image, tagged image file format. And that is an open archival format that is uncompressed. Um, something like a JPEG actually compresses the data and you lose data. Yeah. You've been scanning in JPEG? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, it, it's okay for what you've done, but if you go forward, try and scan to a TIFF if you can. Um, because a JPEG is a compression, what we call a lossy form. So when it makes the file, it's actually going to throw out chunks of data um, to make it because it's going to compress it. A TIFF does not do that. 
it's what we call lossless. Um, so, you know, and then you can make a JPEG from a TIFF if that's what you want, um, if that's what you need to publish or, or something like, because TIFFs can get pretty large. They can, um, uh, some of our files may be up to five megabytes, which doesn't seem like a lot, but if you have thousands of slides, <laughs> you know, it, it gets up there. Um, so I would recommend a TIFF um, as opposed to a JPEG. And, and then for paper, the DPI can be 300. It's, you know, you're not, there's not a lot of image information in a letter <laughs> um, or anything like that. Um, photos that aren't slides like that, I would again recommend something as high as 600, um, 600 minimum, and you can go up from there. Um, and also doing a flatbed scanner um, and not putting it in like a tray or anything like that, because that can damage it. Um, and, um, and yeah, for slides, yeah, for definitely for slides like this, like that don't have mounts, you want to do a flatbed scanner. There are some um, scanners where you can just kind of load a rack of slides, but I found with DMV, um, they get damaged because they're not they're not mounted, and it's just like cardboard. So um, if you have metal mounted slides, you could put them in something, and then they would feed and then it would take about three hours because <laughs> it's like a rack of 50 slides the big size um but yeah so that's slides photo books okay so now my real wheelhouse film <laughs> um so if you have film so this is what we collect this is an eight millimeter film um it's not one of our unique collections i think it's about I think it's a promo, promotional film. Uh, when we get collections, a lot of times we also get cartoons or um, just strain. My granddad has some like golf instructional videos. <laughs> so I often bring those as like examples. <laughs> he had golf and bowling instruction videos. So I've been bringing those as examples of what we're looking at. Um, so this is an eight millimeter film. And um, what you want to do with film is film needs to be super cold. So, and especially acetate. So, um, I would say, yeah, I would say 40 degrees, um, 32 degrees, actually frozen is better, to be honest. Um, again, with that low humidity, 30 to 50%. Um, film is especially, acetate film is especially subject to changes in temperature and humidity. Um, fluctuations in that really cause the decay. Um, <laughs> you're frowning again. Um, so you could store it in a freezer or fridge. I would say still a base, a closet, a cool closet is best. Um, we Don't offer, store it in a fridge. Huh? Don't store it in a fridge. The fridge can be tough because of the moisture content. Um, you would have to, I do, we do have films in the freezer, but I'm very, I have, I have to be on it with moisture and de-ice and all that stuff. Whereas if it's just like your working fridge, you may not be doing that type of maintenance. Um, so that, that's why I hesitate on that one, because the moisture can also really affect the, and damage the film. But I would say a cool dark closet would be best. Um, if you're very sure of your basement's cleanliness and non-susceptible to flooding, that would be best. Or if, you know, you can store it on a high shelf so that if it did flood, it would be okay. Um, and, and for storage, like, so most of the stuff we get comes in boxes like these. Um, I tend to keep them in boxes, and then I buy those container store archival boxes and put these inside. Um, they're acid buffering, so they won't leach acid, but um, so that any acid is kind of repelled. But I like to keep the boxes because there's often written things on here. And these become archival objects as well. Um, so I don't want to just throw stuff away. Um, oh, and this one is, so this is eight, and this is super eight. 
The only real difference is the sprocket holes. Um, the sprocket holes on Super 8 are a bit more rectangular and smaller because they made the image, the picture area bigger. And the sprocket holes are in the center of the frame when you get into the image. For 8, the sprocket holes are more square. And you'll see that they run just kind of along the image line. Um, so eight, Super 8 was not um, produced until 1965. So if you have anything before then, it's on 8. And then if you put two 8s together, I, don't, I didn't bring an example of 60 millimeter, you would have 60 millimeter film. But that's a pretty early format. So that would be 16 millimeter I've mostly found was shot in the 30s, um, because as early as 32, you know, eight millimeter was de developed in 1932. So there's actually, there's a lot of film from the 30s that's on this format. Um, but, you know, I have film from the 30s, 40s that is on 16. Um, my, my great aunt shot 16 in the 50s for some reason, who knows why. She just was a very avid photographer. But in general, that's the kind of timeline we're looking at. Um, Super 8 also has an additional, um, you know, decay thing because some Super 8, I don't think this one has it, uh, some Super 8, Super 8 actually has a magnetic strike because they introduce sound. <coughs> Is this just weird? No oh, bless. Sorry. Um, yeah, so that can also affect the, um, how the film decays um, because of that magnetic strike, which is usually acetate based. Uh, so yeah, this is just leader. I didn't, I didn't grab a super eight example. Um, and we do have some sound collections um, in our archive. Because uh, I think they introduced sound mm, probably the late 70s. You could plug a mic into the camera and talk and narrate stuff. And then when you got the film back, you would see a brown stripe running along the edges here. And then a balanced stripe along this edge as well. Um, so that's an additional, you know, it adds to the possibility of decay. Um, for your own films to kind of test like how deteriorated do you think they are, if they smell like vinegar, you're in a very dangerous zone. If they can, um, because these are acetate based, uh, and when they decay, they leach acetic acid, which smells like vinegar. So if you just kind of take a whiff and go, oh, it's very vinegary, um, then you want to get it to an archive, or you could try and put it in the fridge. That would stabilize it, mm -hmm. but once it start, once, once vinegar syndrome starts, it just keeps going. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we do offer um, climate controlled storage options at Southside and Movie Project, and again, we do full inspection and free digitization of materials. So, um, so those are the things you could go to. Um, Chicago Film Archives also does transfer services. They also offer climate-controlled vault storage. Um, but, you know, if you don't have the money for that, um, trying to put it in a freezer and just being mindful of de-icing a lot, you know, more regularly than you probably would, um, would could, could stabilize it. Um, and then um, color film, if you have color, is also subject to decay. So you can actually, if you come up later, you can actually see that this film is like red. And that's because the dyes have faded. So the dyes are in three layers. Um, I think red is the, red is the base. So it, I think it's blue, yellow, red. And so as it fades, those um, blue and yellow dyes fade away, leaving the film with a red tint. Um, so yeah. And again, you want to label things. Always use a glove with film. Um, and, and yeah. And I and oh, and the next thing is, if you don't know what's on it, don't put it on a projector. Um, if you if the film is deteriorated, 
Um, because again, vinegar syndrome isn't the only, like smelling it is not the only real test to see because it has to get very far along before that you can smell that and it may have deteriorated in other ways before you smell the vinegar. Um, so putting it on a projector can actually damage it further. Um, if you want to see the films, you can always make an appointment with me and I have something that's like a little viewer with a light and we can wind through the film so you can see what's on it. Um, or I'll do a quick inspection and be like, hey, this can't go on a projector and I'll project it for you. But on your own, I wouldn't recommend trying to see what's on the film by putting it on a projector. Um, and then so for video, so this is like VHSC tape, which you may have shot on. Mini DV is another home format. Uh, high 8, that's a real dangerous one. Um, mostly because there are just like no players for it. Um, but actually Dan, I did a workshop a few weeks ago with Dan at Media Burn, he's the archivist. And there's a, um, there are little toggles or plugins you can get to transfer your videos on your own. Um, I think the one he has is like called Elgato, E-L-G-A-T-O, and um, it just plugs into your computer and then would plug into a player. But that's the thing with video, you need a player. So um, VHSC is, is pretty easy because you just need a VHS player if you have one, and then you can buy online. This would snap into like an adapter and then go into a VHS player. Um, high eight again is the trouble one because like there are just no players. <laughs> um, and then mini DV, you can still kind of find pretty regular mini DV decks. Um, if for high eight, especially media burn also offers transfer services because they have those decks. I think their rates are $70 an hour. Um, and it's, it's expensive. Um, so that's why I would recommend trying to get that plug in yourself, resourcing a deck, and then you can digitize your videos yourself. But digitize now, like our pin said, for, for video. Yes. Film, if kept in the right conditions. <laughs> so the other side of this is like a support chronology, basically. And, oh wait, I've, oh sorry, this is the wrong wheel. I have a wheel that also says how long some people last, but film can last for over 100 years if stored in the right conditions. I've been to the Library of Congress vaults. They've pulled out in 1896, George Melier, negative, it was in pristine condition. It's been in a climate controlled vault for the last 100 years. So if you keep it right, film can last for a long time. Video in perhaps less than five years, you're not gonna be able to get the information off these tapes. So you really want to try and transfer your VHS, your mini DV, all that stuff right now. Um, you don't need to transfer to an uncompressed format. It, 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 whatever the Elgato does, an MP4, just something that's viewable is fine. Um, especially you don't want to uncompress because the storage is insane. And uh, 30 minutes of uncompressed video, or 30, I think an hour of uncompressed video is 100 gigabytes. So I do that as an archivist, but I wouldn't recommend that personally for you guys, um, just because of the storage. I would, I mean, I think for a video, you just want to be able to see it, and you don't necessarily need that robust of a preservation format. So something like an MP4, um, you know, even though it's lost, what we call lossy, it's fine. Also because video, like. <laughs> <laughs> the information contained on this tape is not great. Like, the resolution is already not great. It's like 680 by 4, like a very 4.3 resolution. Um, you know, it's not, the signal's not great. So I would say whatever format you can get off of it is fine. Because the chances are you'll only get one try to play it. Um, you can do a kind of visual inspection of your tapes um, before you transfer. If you look at the pack here, you can see it's smooth, there's no crinkles. Um, seeing white flakes here could mean that again, oh, 
they used acetate for everything. Mm -hmm. So all of these formats are subject to that acetate decomposition. So seeing white flakes here could be the acetate leaching off. It could also be mold. Mm -hmm. So be careful of that. Um, if you see any tapes with that, I'd recommend Media Burn because they have cleaning machines. And they can also, if um, it is acetate going to de decomposing so badly, they also, what they do is they bake the tape. They put it in like a, uh, what is it, like a vacuum? What does he do? It's like a convection oven, honestly. On a very low heat to kind of fuse the binder back together and then they get one, then they get one shot and trying to get some of the uh, content off. Um, and then you can also, so on tapes, there's usually a little button you can press in here and flip it open. And just kind of look and see, this looks good to me. But do you see those white flakes? Do you see, is it mold or something like that? Is there other damage, creases, um, tears, uh, large strikes in the image, um, that's something that could clue you in that maybe this tape won't transfer very well. Um, but this one actually looks pretty good. So this would be what they put in the camera. Um, I would also recommend this record tab, turning it to on so you don't accidentally. This makes sure that you don't record over the tape. Some it's a switch, um, so you just do off, on. Others for VHS, you actually have to like punch it out. <laughs> um, but I would recommend doing that so that when you put it in the player, there's no um, accidents where you accidentally hit the record button or something and then you're recording over your home movies, <laughs> you know. Um, so yeah, and for in terms of storage, you want, um, I would recommend external drives. Um, you know, depending on the content, it can be hard to know how much storage you need, but you know, one of this is 30 minutes, an MP4 copy would be maybe like two to five gigabytes. So if you have 30 of these, 30 times five is 180 gigabytes. Um, I would say that kind of um, doing those kind of metrics, and then paper is like two megabytes of material, like paper and photo are two to maybe perhaps even five megabytes of material with the recommendations they've given you. So they won't take up a lot of space. It's really film and video that will take up the most space on a drive. Um, but if you say, oh, I think I'll need 500 gigabytes, get a one terabyte drive. And then what you would do is you would put it in RAID mode, R-A-I-D. So what that does is actually mirror the content on the drive so that if something fails, you still have um, I know, <laughs> it's a lot. I know it's a lot. I have my card here, so if you have more questions, you can always email me and I will go step by step with you on how to do this. Um, but I think the big takeaway is whatever storage you think you need, double it. And yeah, but it's on the same drive. It's on the same drive, but it may be a different. So RAID, it, if part of it fails, you would still have the information. Because, and then Why you, wouldn't you just get two, two drives? Um, because then, well, what if both of them fail? Okay, question. Mm -hmm. So I have a one terabyte thing. Yeah, that thing. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to go into that, and so that means it'll be on that copy twice? Yes. Yeah, R R A I D. Put it in RAID mode. Raid. How do, how okay. do you put it yeah. in RAID mode? You can Google it. Um, basically, the, the problem, though, is if you already have content on it, you're going to want to take that off. And because doing RAID mode, will act, will need, you need to erase it and then put the content back on. So if you have content on, you could if you could move it to cloud storage briefly, or if you think you're just your laptop can store it, briefly, and then put it in RAID mode. She just said, go buy another terabyte thing, not her. <laughs> she just said, go buy another terabyte. That's what I heard you say. Yeah. Yeah, all you, all, I, all you would need to do is move the content temporarily. You would 
remove your content, change the mode of the drive, and then move it back. But the thing with RAID, which is why I said double it, because if you put something in RAID mode, you're going to have the storage. So you're actually going to have only 500 gigabytes to work with because it's going to mirror the content. It that's, automatically does that. It automatically yeah. does that. So that's why, so even if it fails, most likely the chances are, since you have two copies, even though they're on the same drive, you would still be able to get it off. Um, so one copy will, if one copy fails, it does not affect the other copy? Yes, exactly. Um, also what you can do um, I mean, we do, Lark of this, there's something called locks. Lots of copies keep stuff safe. So I don't recommend cloud storage as your main preservation thing because that's fraught with third, it's owned by a third party, you're, where is your data on some server in California. But if you have the external drive plus cloud storage, um, your, your, your content, you can kind of be sure it's pretty backed up. Yeah, right. just to do, yeah, just to keep from having yeah, they need to just do two, two drives. My, the thing with RAID is because the mirror copy, if one part fails, it doesn't affect the other part. What would happen if even in those two drives, they both fail? But I will put the second one in RAID before oh, I Oh, before you copy it. Oh, then yeah. that's, yeah, that's good. Yeah. And then you have them with three, and then if you upload the duplicate, I know it's a lot. Digital preservation is well, it's just I mean if you like to do it, it's not yeah, it's just yeah. And that's the cloud storage. I mean if you use Google Drive, I use Box because the universal target is just like you know, the data. Um but anything like that, you know, you can do so even when you drive fails, you can erase it to see if it's repairable and then you need it. So yeah, that's the cloud storage. Yeah. 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 Um, I have quite a bit of like oral history mm -hmm. and, um, that we've done together on our screen drive. And I have been told that the, you put I, there wasn't enough space on the Oh, yeah. So is there a way to put, put it on the cloud? I mean, if, if you have an awful lot of material? So we have a lot. So that's what I was going to say. We have a lot. Uh -huh. So for most cloud storage services, the two we have are probably two gigabytes like 15 gigabytes. Um, Apple is five. Dropbox is three. Um, and then with upgrades, I upgraded to my cloud storage first. Oh, I so you just upgrade. Yeah. Until yeah, it's per month or something? Oh, you can just upgrade. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. It's not yeah. oh. yeah. um, yeah. um, yeah. a So that's how fa how rapidly things are changing. So always keep the format. Then you're more different because <laughs> I would say video is the hardest because you want to do it in the Possibly other people can do it. Yeah, you can.
Duplicate things. So it's, it's not, not going to re. It's not going to. No, you'd have to rescan the photo mm. for it to be a real. It's okay. It's, okay. <laughs> it's easy for us to say. Yeah. Oh, it's man. it's tough. I mean, because ninety six by ninety six is almost like web resolution, which is very low. It's tiny. So you want something like three hundred DPI is generally publishing quality. Um. And I would suggest then even 600 because there's so much, oh, I didn't bring a photo, but there's so much color and other information in a photo that you want to capture. There you go, yeah. So see, look how, look how much information is, is present here in terms of the lights and darks, the color, um, the shadows. Um, you 600 DPI will hopefully give a faithful reproduction of that. Whereas 96 is, is not going to. Um, Which means dots per inch. Dots per inch. So, so the more, yeah, so sorry. Uh, the more dots you have, the more it's going to reproduce. So like in 96, it's going to sample like here, here, here. 600 is going to be like do, 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 so that's that's why the higher DPI, the higher the resolution. So if we bring movies to you, digitize them for us? Yep, for free. Mm -hmm. And then you keep a copy, or what's the deal? How we keep work? a copy. Mm -hmm. um, it gets published on our digital archives, which I can show you. Um, if if there are films that too personal, I'll hide them, but in general. Is there a disclaimer like they're not available? Mm -hmm. okay. um, there's a there's a collection of it's not her actual birth, the birth of her son, but she's like in the hospital and it's like, oh, I'll come back to you. Mm -hmm. um, so this is from his collection. Most of our films are silent. So it gets published there. We might use it in events. Um, you would get a copy via that cloud storage I talked about. And then I also preserve the digital copy in like three different places. <laughs> um, and I preserve the uncompressed version. But what I would give to you is a access, like a MP4, unless you specifically request. Yvonne, I know you're a filmmaker, so if you want like a ProRes or something to edit with, I can give that to you. Mm -hmm. um, but generally, I just give like a, a high quality MP4 to people. Mm -hmm. um, some people request a DVD, DVD, which I reluctantly make and don't do because it's super hard <laughs> to do a publishable DVD that you can put in a player. Um, and and yeah, and then so, so that that's part of being in the archive is knowing your things will be online for people to search. Um, we catalog everything. Casty and Maggie are my expert catalogers. Casty also does inspection. Um, we do a full inspection of your films to make sure there's no measuring deterioration. That vinegar syndrome scale I talked about. Um, repairing splices if there are bad splices. Um, looking at date information, which we can find. There's something called edge code. Um, looks like this. But it's on the um, edges of the film. Kodak printed that, which just means these symbols correspond to years that um, say when the film was manufactured. Mm -hmm. And if there's no, like this one just says airport. So if there's no other date information, we kind of use that to put that. 
Um, this means 1986. Okay. <laughs> That's cool. I'm a nerd who can't put tattoos on them. Um, so yeah. And I'm just going to collect them here. I said 25. Um, I think about 20, less than that are online to summer in process. Um, and then you would also just sign an agreement with us that basically says we can use the material. And then we would also film an own history with yeah. you and as many family members as we can get to talk about where you grew up. Jackie always likes to ask what camera you used to film things, where did you go, what schools you went to, um, and all of that. And then that would also get published. You would have a chance to review it. We would transcribe and review it. And then that also goes public. We do get retain the rights, but it doesn't mean you can't use it or exhibit it or make new works or do anything else. Um, I think that was something I couldn't get out of because we were part of the University of Chicago system. Um, and it does make my life easier in terms of like if the donor dies and then the grandkids are like, why am I filming online? And there's then there's no dispute because I have a signed agreement with them. But I do want to impress upon you that you can do whatever you can do whatever you want with the film. Um, and we do I do get requests from documentary people, producers wanting footage. But um, if it's for commercial use, I'm always in touch with you to be like, do you want to be a part of this? Is this okay? Um, this is what they want to use. I usually try and ask for a rough cut just to see. How it's going to be used, um, and then you would also then your collection would then be credited in the film if it's used. Um, I get a lot of requests so far, but nothing was actually panned out. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, so, oh, and so here's the orbital suits. These aren't up because uh, they need to be trimmed. They need to be captioned for accessibility. So that's just an example of what we do. Nice. Um, this is Alice McClellan who shot the film. And this is his daughter, Susan. So again, we do try to get as many family members as possible. If, poss if they're still living, the person who shot the footage, and um, also sons and daughters and people who may appear in the footage as well. Um, so yeah, this is the one that's captioned right now. And then you can see they live in uh, the Princeton, Roseland in the Princeton Park. This is our main page as well. Anything you can click, anything you click, you can watch. Um, uh, so yeah, but and then uh, there is also an option. You can do a deposit with us, which would mean we inspect, digitize, and actually return the physical films to you. Or, like I said, we can also store them. So that's up to that's up to you whether you want us to keep them. And we have a climate control vault on campus where I rehouse them. And Um, and digital preservation is like 30 to 40 percent of my job yeah. <laughs> you know figuring out okay what formats are people moving to transferring things to both our remote server and also um, there's now a digital library um, repository at U Chicago so now I'm in the process of also transferring stuff through them and they'll maintain like fixity data and I also have stuff on LTO tapes, which are uh, magnetic tape format that a lot of archives use because it is physical. It's a physical tape, but the storage is digital, and it's very um, it's very good for long term preservation. I think the current ones you can store about two point five terabytes of data on them, and um, so I have those. And now I need to figure out. I, I, there's also a geographic dispersal thing with archives, so I need to figure out who can I, what friend can I mail them to, so that wow. if there's a disaster, we still have things on that. You, you can still access it. 
So, but that's an archive, you know. I don't think for you to, for your personal stuff, you need to be that robust, but I would still recommend keeping as many copies as you can, whether in the cloud or through external storage. Or, or yeah, or DVDs, but just be mindful that a DVD is not gonna last as long as you think. <laughs> Um, are there any other questions? Hi. Hi. Let me just ask one question. Yeah. Up. From everything you tell us, and all the interesting, what's the most important thing that comes out for everything? For everything. I would say do put things in proper storage, like I said. That's the best way to preserve it long time, long term, I mean. Um, again, with paper, I mean, we have stuff from the 1300s. So again, it is a medium that's pretty robust once pro put in proper storage, the same with film. Again, like I mentioned that 1896, that was nearly 100 and what, 20 years ago, and it's still in mint condition. So, in the proper storage, um, things can last, except video. Video is taken out of the equation. Um, the don'ts, um, don't throw anything away. <laughs> Again, video is out of that equation. Ignore video because the recommendations are different, but don't throw anything away. Because uh, again, like I said, there may come a time where you need to go back to the originals and you know, maybe they'll come up with some crazy new digital format, or your MP4 will stop being supported, so you need to re-digitize. Um, or yeah, or your TIFF will stop being supported for some reason, we don't know. So you need to re-digitize to some new format. Um, so yeah, don't throw anything away. Do put it in proper storage, I would say. Those are the big ones. And then for video, the do's and don'ts, do digitize now. And don't wait. <laughs> <laughs> so I have an old camera. I bought a camera that came with that film. So I should go ahead and just use that. Videotape it now. Put something on it. Because it'll be too late soon. Yeah. Okay. Um, and if you have to film the camera, that's another way to digitize it. Because you could put the tape in the camera. And there's usually outputs. And you can use this Elgato thing to plug into the camera and then plug into your computer. So either you just need the camera that was used or look on eBay. And the resolution isn't going to be like great, right? Like no, I mean, it'll be good for video. I mean, video's already in standard definition, which is not that great resolution. I mean, that's a 680 by 480 picture. There's no way to make a better copy. You could up res it, but it's not going to really do anything because you're just replicating data. There isn't, like for video and for film, there isn't data for you to, there isn't like extra data for you to capture. Um, it is what it is. It is what it is. It is standard definition and what you get is what you get. Like there's not like some secret hidden, hidden data where it's like, oh yeah, it can be 1080p somehow, no. <laughs> It's always going to be standard definition. <laughs> you get up res it to 1080p, but it probably won't look that different because yeah. it's just going to replicate what's already, stuff, what's already there to make it into a 1080 picture. Mm -hmm. um, I have like 100 mini DV. Oh, mini DV. Mini DV, you also want to watch out. Look and see if they say ME, which stands for metal evaporated, because that causes more decay. I need to transfer all this. You need to transfer yeah. digitize now. It's going to get midterm. <laughs> yes. So uh, the, the standard video is 680 by 40, did you say? By 480. Oh, by 480. Which is standard definition. Okay. Whereas now, this TV is what? 1080i, 1080p picture. Um, video is like... <laughs> like this. <laughs> it's a little yeah. box. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you could up res it to make it fit the screen, yeah. but it won't look any different. It's still gonna look like those home movies. Yeah. 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 Okay, that's my last question. Uh, all right. So everybody walked out of here. And they had a video camera that was 
still coming. And there was this one rainbow in all the time that happens with a uh, giraffe film lover. <laughs> what should we put a rep captured in, film or video? I mean, a film a rainbow? I mean, the, the, the scene, because it's going to be, it's going to happen once in a trillion years. But what should it, what, if we had a choice? Of we have a choice, number, 35 millimeter film. It should be in film. 35 and millimeter. 35 millimeter. <laughs> no, of course, it should be film or should be video. Film. Film. Why do you say film? Film already has a better resolution than video. Um, okay. For 35 millimeter film, we still don't have the scanning techniques to truly capture the resolution in film because there's so much information in each image. So 35 is about, it's about this big. Um, 16, people do, I can show you 16, you can it, you can see. So we actually partner with um, the National Museum of African American History and Culture to do our transfers. And so even this is like, this is like a 30 megabyte copy. And you can still see how clear the image is. This is like, we call it 2K scan. You can go as high as 8K now, <laughs> which is not necessary for 16, but it's close to capturing 35 millimeter. Um, and this looks even better on the higher quality access files I use. Even compress down like this. That's Gene, sorry. That's my older sister. She married him. She's one of five children. That's another sister. Top hat is dad and mom. Uh, Abe hmm. and mom. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so this is an Easter Christmas combined reel from 1955. Wow. Where did, which neighborhood is this? They live in Chatham. But I'm still trying to locate the church. He was an AME minister, but they're obviously at some church that I'm not sure. Oh, yeah, there it is. Okay. So this is 454. What, uh, what year is this? It's 55, oh, yeah. 1955. Oh, yeah. So we do, you do have 16 millimeter as late as 1955. Um, my great, like I said, my great aunt was also shooting things that late. Okay. Um, but the primary format during this time period for home movies would have been 8 millimeter. Um, and what they did for home movies they is... They were in Chatham? In I don't know. See, that's why I don't they know where they are. They lived in Chatham in 55. They lived in Chatham. They lived in Chatham in 55? She was one of the first people. Oh. Okay. She was a blockbuster, yeah. yeah. I was about to say, how could they have been in Chatham? That's the same Mary's. It's that same Mary's. Okay, where is that? Does anyone remember? So it's St. Mary's. So remember. sister, sister. That's Miss cool. Jean. That's Miss Jean. And that was her sister. Ethel lived in Brownsville. Yeah, I mean, they also lived in the Ida B. Wells homes at some point. Um, but I do know that Miss Jean and her husband were the first African Americans to move into 84th and Prairie. And then all the whites moved out, and actually the rest of the Patton family started moving in. So there's actually like five of them on that one block. <laughs> St. Mary's, that was my struggle with Googling because I couldn't see what type of church. Like St. Mary's is kind of a common name. Um, but yeah, so that's also the kind of work we do with cataloging. Miss Jean is now 99. Oh, wow. We did her oral history two years ago. And so she's not, you know, we did it with her niece, great niece and uh, her niece and great nephew, but it's hard for her to remember that stuff. So. There's an old St. Mary's Church that's the size of my home right here. It's a Catholic church, but it's built in the 1800s. I don't think it was in its famous teeth. So, yeah. Um, Somebody could probably tell you what block that was. Yeah, I may, I'm, I'll probably just email Keon um, and ask him. 
Keon Foreman is starting right now. Um, and he was in the in the movies before he started the rest of them. Um, so yeah, so this was done by the National Museum of African American Culture. Um, they also do machine doesn't have the magnetic sound reader. I can get the image but not the sound. Um, so I send it to them and they give me a really cool thing. Um, but yeah, you can see this little weird thing. They keep a copy of it on hand. Uh, they keep a copy of what they call a study collection. Because they're a museum, they can't expression things like us when we exhibit in the field. Hmm. Um, so their project is actually more about just kind of scanning and giving people back the um, material. You can make an appointment with them, and they have the, they have the VHS, they have all the tape players, they even have audio equipment. Um, if you have vinyl or cassettes, they have this big, <laughs> big scanning machine with this film. And then basically they scan it and give it to the MUC. They're not necessarily keeping things like us, just because it's they need approval. Um, I don't know if they're going to get, when I was getting them, we actually had a committee that approved um, a lot of some of these collections. Yeah. So the curator gave recommendations and the committee went through it. Um, so that's why they can't really question it, but they do have the so called study collection. And that's why it's So you see, he's a minister. We also have some stuff from, from Africa in the museum. Like your uh, Alpha, Alpha, and then really big. They do that every time. I mean, so what's great about this collection is that can stay in this place for two weeks. And you see sources for a year. You see sources for like over a month or a year. And they, they, they divided them. There's one in the 70s with Dion in it. And he's writing a play. But they do like a back and forth. Like they're all taking in their fur coat and dressed to the nines. And little um, indigo. This is the, they said this is a Disney Christmas. That was just their mission. Huh. And they would come here dressed up and play it off. And it was fun. And they would play And then they were like, and it always divided to something good. And what's the record of the past? Mm -hmm. It's been Robert, oh yeah, hundreds of years. We figured out that the records of this are just like the hundreds of years. And it's just kind of weird that that was something where we were kind of in between them. And he was kind of like, the brother came in and he's like, I have some film. And he just like, and again, he just lived down the block. Thank you.